Hi, I'm Sam Ben Yaakov. This presentation is about power MOSFET drivers. It will include discussion on input charge, drive requirement, gate losses, transformer isolation, and how to solve some of the problems with a DC restorer, high and low side drive, and ground and power ground and ground potential differences. Now, what is the problem of a drive of a MOSFET transistor? Here is a typical switch mode converter. This is a boost converter. There's an inductor, a diode, the output section, and the transistor, MOSFET in this case, that you have to turn on and off. To turn it on and off, you have to drive the gate to a high voltage and then back to a low voltage. Now, the voltage that you have to get uh, to turn the transistor on depends on the transistor, of course, the technology. Uh, it'll range between 5 and 15 volts. So you have to provide a pulse, say, going up to, say, 10 volts, and then going back to zero. Now, the gate of a MOSFET transistor is actually an insulator. The input resistance is very high. That is, in DC, there is no current actually coming in. However, the gate is around or includes capacitors. So in order to raise the potential or the voltage of the gate from zero to a given voltage, you have to charge these capacitors. So this is the problem that we have to face. We have to charge the capacitor and we have to charge them pretty fast in order to turn the transistor fast enough for the operation of the converter. Now this is here is a picture which we'll talk about it in more detail a little bit later, but still let me just start here with this concept of charge that we have to provide. This is the charge that we'll have to pump into the gate. This is the voltage, how it rises. And what we see here that at the beginning there's a zero voltage here and we have to provide some charge to bring the voltage and it's going, going up linearly. It's going up linearly because here we have passive uh, sort of capacitors. Actually, these are the gate to source and gate to drain capacitors. It's this capacitor plus this capacitor that we first have to charge until we get to this threshold voltage. The threshold voltage is the voltage at which the transistor actually starts to conduct. At this point, the voltage, it, the drain starts to go down and consequently this charge of CGD, this capacitor between gate and drain, is now changing more rapidly and to a larger extent. This brings up this Miller effect or Miller capacitance, we'll talk about it a little bit later, which makes the gate look like having a very big capacitor. So the voltage barely goes up, although we are pumping in more and more charges. Eventually the transistor will go into saturation and so the voltage here, the drain, will be almost zero. And again, we'll have two passive capacitors that we are charging to the maximum that we want to go. In this particular case, I'm showing 15 volt. As I've said, it really depends on the type of the transistor. Now, one point to remember is that the, these capacitors are nonlinear capacitors, so it's not just a fixed capacitor. As the voltage changes, the capacitance is changing. So if we look at the current to the gate as we provide a pulse through the driver we talk about, uh, what we are going to see, this is the pulse, the voltage comes in here. Uh, we'll see that the current sort of goes up at the beginning because we are charging this capacitor. And then as we reach the threshold, it'll sort of taper off and starts going down, the voltage still going up a little bit because of this remnant current, and then it stabilizes. At this point, there is no current because it's, as I've said, it's like an uh, uh, insulator. And the same thing goes during the turn off. As we turn the voltage down to zero, uh, we have a spike to the negative side, and similarly, we have these uh, changes uh, as a function of time. So the question is, how can we calculate how much drive do we need in order to turn on and off the transistor? There are actually two ways to do it. And the first one is the equivalent capacitor method, which I'll talk about first. 
So the problem we are facing is we are asking ourselves, how much current do we have to uh, deliver to the gate in order to turn the transistor on and off at a given time so that uh, the transition will be uh, during the time that we wish. So the first method, as I've said, is the equivalent resistance, capacitor. The idea here is that we are going to replace this whole assembly with sort of an equivalent capacitor. Uh, it's not actually represented what is happening as the capacitors are being charged, etc. But this equivalent capacitor will represent the total uh, amount of charge that you need uh, to pump in in order to get to the uh, voltage of the gate that you wish. So it is serving as a means of calculating the amount of charge. So here's the way we are going to do it. Uh, we have these two capacitors which are playing the role uh, in this case. At the beginning, with zero voltage, the capacitor CGS has a zero voltage on it, here it is. And capacitor CGD, that is between the drain and the gate, this capacitor is already charged because the voltage here is zero. We are at the off stage, this is before the on, so current is flowing here. The voltage here is the V out, so this capacitor is actually charged to V out. Here we see it. Charged to V out, this is zero at the beginning. Now we turn the transistor on by providing this pulse, and we now look at the end, that is when the transistor is already, when the transistor is in the conduction, full conduction state. In this case, CGS that is the capacitor between the gate and the source, will be charged to the maximum voltage that we uh, provided here to charge the gate. So the amount of charge depends on the uh, capacitance and the final voltage. This capacitor, however, uh, plays an important role because uh, it uh, is exposed to very large changes. While the voltage here from the gate goes from zero to whatever voltage we wish to reach, this voltage, once the transistor starts to conduct, once the transistor starts to conduct, this voltage starts to go down, this voltage here starts to go down, and as it goes down, there's a large voltage swing between V out, eventually it will re reach zero potential, that is, this point is going to reach ground potential. So there is a big change on this uh, capacitor from zero here, V out here, to VGS here, and zero here. So if we take all these changes into account, we can calculate the equivalent capacitor, which uh, turns out to be CGS. This is the original capacitor between gate and source. There is no difference here because it's not exposed to any special condition. However, CGD, that is this feedback sort of capacitor, this is the Miller capacitor, uh, is exposed to this very large chain that exhibits itself as this uh, factor here, which is V out over VGS max. Now, V out could be very high, it could be 300 volt, or maybe more. And VGS is, say, 15. So there is a uh, boosting up factor that is a sort of a gain factor. This is this called Miller effect, uh, which makes this CGD looks much, much larger. So the total uh, capacitor, capacitance, is uh, this plus this time uh, the uh, coefficient of, of Miller effect. So once we know this total capacitor, we can calculate the required uh, charge that we need, because if we assume that uh, we want to charge this capacitor to a given voltage, so this is the charge, uh, the charge then is the current times T on, from which we can calculate the current that we need as C equivalent times this VGS max uh, over T on. Now there is another way to calculate or estimate the total charge that you need, and this would be just by looking at data sheets of the transistor. Manufacturers are providing this information in the data sheet with curves that looks like this. This is something we have already talked about. This portion here is charging the gate to the 
Vt, V sub T, the threshold, and then it goes on until the transistor actually uh, uh, is fully contacting, and then we go have again these two capacitors. Now, it turns out, because of what we have seen before, that this portion here is dependent on V out. The larger the V out, the larger uh, or the farther uh, we need to charge this capacitor for the reason that we have just seen. So if you know what is the V out and uh, you have the data sheet, you can estimate the total, you can just read it off the chart, what is the total uh, charge that you need. And this total charge is the current times t, t on, actually it's not t on, it should be t rise, that is the rise time. And therefore we have uh, the current being calculated as the, this Q, this, the total uh, charge time T rise that you wish to have, T rise time. Here it is, this is the T rise time, this is the T rise time, and again, this is the uh, equation for total charge over the rise time. Again, total charge you can calculate either take it from the data sheet or you can uh, actually calculate it from the equivalent capacitor. Now, during the charging, the current is fairly constant. And the reason for that is that we have a large portion here in which the transistor is sort of within the threshold voltage. And this is when this uh, uh, changes, large changes are taking place, that this uh, point here is moving and from V out uh, going down to ground. So during this time, the voltage of the gate is about threshold voltage. So this is threshold voltage, and this is the input voltage, so the current is just about constant. So this is a good approximation. So here is a numerical number. Suppose we want a rise time of 100 nanoseconds, and we have a transistor with a total Q of 50 nanocolon. This is a pretty hefty transistor. That's a big transistor uh, with a large area. And we see here that we need 0.5 amp for this 100 nanosecond. That is, this current is, of course, for the very short time of this rise time. And later on, it's zero. But still, we do have to provide a uh, in instant current of 0.5 amp. That's a large current, and a small uh, circuit, uh, low power circuit, will not do it. You do need a driver. So this is the need for a driver that will provide for a short time a current sufficient to bring the gate voltage from zero to whatever voltage you want. I'm always talking here about bringing the voltage from zero to VGS, but the problem is exactly the same while discharging the uh, gate from the voltage of VGS max to zero, you do have to provide the same current, although it will be in the opposite direction. So what are the other problems we have to face and we have to recognize? One of them is the fact that while you need the high current, there is quite a bit of a power loss involved because what you're doing, you take the driver, you provide the current, charge the gate to a certain voltage. The energy stored in the, in the capacitance will be VGS squared C over 2, say, the energy stored in a capacitor. Now, as it turns out, this process is a lossy process, and the same amount is actually lost uh, to actually heating the a resistor. So the sum of this is the total um, energy you have to provide while turning on the transistor. Now this energy uh, in the transistor itself is also lost because during turn off you just dump it to ground and actually dissipating the power on the RG. So the total loss is VGS square CE for each transistor transition. Now, if the frequency is high, you have that many transition per second, and the power is not small, and it really depends on the situation of the Q, uh, the frequency, and many other parameters. So, 
Another way to look at it is to say that we have to provide a certain uh, charge to the gate from a source of uh, VGS. So the total energy per transition is VGS over times Q. And the power will be VGS times Q times the frequency. So if you take an example, uh, here is a smaller transistor, only 10 nano long 15 amp VGS, frequency of 200 kilohertz, we are talking about 30 milliwatts. Now, if, of course, the transistor will be larger, if the frequency will be larger, now there is, a, of course, a trend to go to a higher and higher frequencies to make the converter smaller and smaller, so proportionally the power will start building up um, to a larger uh, value. Another point that I like to uh, stress and to explain is that sometimes you really want to turn on the transistor uh, in a slower way, and most of the time we would like to turn it off very fast. And here's the reason. During turn on, as we turn on the transistor, whatever the topology is, I'm showing you here a topology of the boost, but it's exactly the same for back or back boost. Uh, as we turn the transistor on, we impose the reverse voltage on the diode. And as we impose the reverse diode, a reverse voltage on the diode, there is a reverse current. Okay, And this current, for a short period of time, could build up to very large values, because during this process, when the transistor is on, it's actually a short here. And because the, the diode, until the charge is depleted in the junction, the diode is actually conducting both ways. So there is a sort of a short here, and it'll be a very high spike. This brings about a lot of uh, electromagnetic interference. And many times you like to slow it. You slow it by putting a fairly large resistor. However, during turn off, you really like the transistor to turn off very quickly. The reason is that if you turn it quickly, and with the inherent capacitance that you have at the transistor, the voltage will go up slowly. So therefore, you will have a small overlap between current and voltage on the transistor, and consequently, switching losses will be lower. So, in some application, you really like to turn off on slower and turn off fast. Well, one way to do it is here with this little circuit here. Uh, we're using a PNP transistor. Here it is. This is the emitter of the transistor. That's the collector. That's the base. And what happens here is the following. During the on time, we go through this RG that could be a fairly large, like 200 ohms or 100 ohms, as opposed to uh, 5 or 10 ohms for the regular fast transition case. And we have another uh, limiting current uh, resistor. So that RG is actually turning the uh, MOSFET in a slower rate. However, during turn off, as we bring this voltage here to ground, we have this circuit here in which the uh, Total resistance is RG plus, say, RB. These are the, these two resistors. The voltage here will be about VT. This is during the uh, around the threshold voltage. And so, therefore, this transistor is in an active zone. And then, if we look at it, uh, we have a voltage VBE here. This is VBE. We have a voltage VT. So the voltage across the resistor is Vt minus Vbe, over R is the current, and the collector current here is Ib times HFE. So let's take an example. Suppose Vt is 8 volt, Vbe approximately 1 volt, R, say total R is 330 ohms, HFE 50, and as you can see, we can reach, uh, say, 1 amp current flowing in here, and very quickly discharging the capacitance of the gate. So this will be an active sort of grounding procedure. By the way, uh, when you look at here, you actually see a diode uh, when the transistor is in the uh, 
saturation condition. Another point that uh, should be brought up is the question of uh, parasitic oscillations. Now, no matter what you do, there will be always some uh, stray inductance in the lines here and here, and therefore you have here a uh, resonant circuit. This is the equivalent capacitor, the inductor, and the resistor that you're going to put in. Now, if the quality factor is high, then you'll have oscillation. This is very bad because the voltage can go high above the permissible voltage of the gate and actually can damage it and in any case it go up and up and up and down and like going down it'll turn the transistor off again. So this is very bad. In order to combat this, of course, you have to reduce the leakage as much as you can. I mean the stray inductance. But uh, if uh, you did whatever you can and there's still some oscillation, the only way uh, to um, damp the oscillation will be just to increase the resistor. Now, how much do we have to increase it? Well, the Q is the uh, characteristic impedance over the resistance. Characteristic impedance is the square root of L, the inductance over the capacitance. And so uh, we have to add this or change this RG so that Q will be approximately 1. If we know these two, we can calculate what is the amount, or we can do it experimentally, uh, increasing the uh, resistance until we damp the oscillation. OK, so how do uh, gate drivers look like? Well, the most common and has been classical driver that has been around for many, many years, although it's now being replaced, is this uh, complementary push-pull transistor. Uh, these are BJT transistor, bipolar junction transistors. There's a PNP and an NPN transistor. And uh, the drive here will turn the transistor, the, the plus uh, transistor, this one on. This will be like an emitter follower. And when it's low, it's also an emitter follower. It's very similar to what we've seen before. So this is a very nice drive very uh, reliable and efficient. Uh, however, this is the a little bit older uh, BJT technology. Uh, another way is to use two MOSFETs, um, and uh, you can use an N channel, P channel, uh, but you have to be very careful that at midway, that is when the voltage here is midway between zero and VC, uh, both transistors will be off. And this really depends on the threshold of each transistor. So the threshold actually of this transistor must be much lower than half VC. And then you are sure that uh, there is no current flowing this way. Because if you have a voltage here which will turn this transistor on and this transistor on, uh, this is bad news. Uh, you can, uh, of course, uh, burn this transistor uh, out. Uh, Using two N-channel transistor is bad because uh, you have a, uh, a situation that both can conduct. This is just no way to go. So drivers are actually uh, available uh, as uh, standalone units. That's a gate drive. You put here low power signal and you get a high current output or they can be part of a controller, a PWM controller, and a part of it you'll have the driver. So let's have a look at the commercial driver. So this is the input section. Uh, there is some logic here. You can tailor it with, with uh, positive pulse, negative pulse, etc. This is not that important for our discussion. Here we have uh, the driver itself. This is a totem pole uh, type of a driver, you see these are two NPN transistors, the two of them. Uh, there is a transistor here, and once uh, you turn it, uh, say, off, the voltage will be high here, and you drive high here, so it's an inverting uh, arrangement, while when this is high, you will drive this one, and at this, at this time, uh, the voltage here will be a low enough so you are not uh, driving this. So this arrangement is very nice because you have uh, uh, 
active pushing and pulling of current uh, from the device, and you can get these two very high uh, currents, uh, peak currents, of course, not continuous. Now, in some application, however, you have to drive a transistor which is on the high side, as we say. This is, say, a half bridge, so these transistors are turned on and off in an alternate way. And here you have to drive this transistor. Now, you have to drive it and provide the voltage between its source and the gate of this transistor, not as referred to ground, of course. This has to be, so you need a driver which is sort of floating here because this point can be going up and down and um, you somehow have to provide the signal in here and have this gate driving this higher side. By the way, this is the same situation in a, a back converter with a uh, N-channel transistor, a MOSFET transistor, you have the same situation. So one way to go around is to use a transformer. Uh, with a transformer, you can sort of provide here a pulse and come up with a pulse which is isolated and can be a potential which is much higher than, of course, the potential here. There's no common ground here. However, there is a problem with the basic use of a transformer. And the problem is that, number one, you cannot provide a positive pulse to a transformer. The average voltage provided to any inductor must be zero. So you must put a capacitor. Otherwise, a uh, transformer will go into saturation due to the DC current. It will be short. So you put a capacitor. And what will happen is, if, if you have this uh, waveform, uh, what you'll get here and here will be uh, now AC around zero, not without DC. There'll be no DC anymore at the output. And the same thing goes uh, if uh, this is the shape uh, here, there's a problem because you see you get a high side here and a low side here because the area must be the same. So there is a problem with just a simple use of a transformer. One way to overcome it is to use sort of like a forward converter. What we have here is here the transformer, and um, we turn it on, and we get the pulse very nicely at the output. Now when we turn off the transistor, this is sort of the driver, uh, there is an auxiliary winding for resetting the magnetization of the core, and this will provide actually a negative voltage here, which is nice because you like to have a negative voltage here on the gate to turn it off faster. And this is the way to go, but it is a relatively complex uh, circuit. Another problem that you have in the transformer is, is the leakage inductance. And consequently, uh, you are increasing the uh, possibility of oscillation, as we have talked about uh, earlier. So um, there is a problem here, too. So what can we do in order to alleviate the problem of this uh, duty cycle dependence and the fact that you cannot transfer a DC through a transformer? Well, what you can do is to use this uh, concept of DC restorer. Actually, this comes from uh, television circuitry, but uh, we use it here in, in this way. First of all, we have two capacitors, one at the input and one at the output. Now, we provide these pulses here, and of course, after the capacitor, we're going to have the same shape, but with no DC. So the zero is here, and this is the volt. And this is what we are going to have at the output. We are going to have at the output of the transformer, we are going to have a square wave, but uh, with a shifted ground. So now we have this capacitor and diode. Now, what will happen is that during the negative part, this capacitor will actually be charged to this portion here, to this V minimum. It will be charged this way. So when the positive part comes in, it will be added to this negative part and building up again the same voltage as before. So this is called the DC restore, and it, this actually brings you back the same form as you have it here with a DC average, which you cannot get just with a transformer. So here is a 
rather more sophisticated or more elaborated uh, circuit that used this concept, but actually it has more to it. So here we see the transformer, the two capacitors. We have this part here, this is the DC restorer. But as we provide here the positive pulse, this is during the positive part of the uh, cycle, uh, we first of all feed this driver, but then we also use this same uh, pulse to charge a capacitor, which you might say is the uh, power supply of this driver. So we have a power coming in through here, charging the capacitor, the signal is coming this way, and then we have this push-pull complementary uh, transistor type driver, which is fed from this signal, but has a power source uh, from here. This is very nice because it's also self-contained. You don't have to carry any um, voltage uh, supply, power supply, floating power supply here. It's all provided by itself, and it restores the pulse to its uh, original shape. Another possibility uh, to use this DC restorer is in cases when you have an offset. This is an example. I'm not going into all of it. It's kind of complex. Let's talk of just about this transistor. This is a P-channel transistor. This is its source. This is a fixed potential which is higher, of course, than ground. This is ground, this is ground, this is ground. This is a higher potential. And we have to switch on this transistor. So we have uh, here a capacitor and a driver, and this driver is referred to ground. So when this voltage here is zero, and this capacitor will be actually charged to this bus voltage. So when we have the pulse coming in, this would be a negative pulse because this is the p-channel, so in order to turn it off, you have a, need a, pulse, a negative pulse. If you have a negative pulse, it'll go through this capacitor, and then when it comes back, it'll sort of recharge the capacitor through this diode. So this is actually a DC restore used to drive a transistor, which is sitting on a bus of a potential which is different, much different than the, than the ground. But we need actually more uh, simple solution that we can use in the case of uh, these uh, high side drives. And there are other possibilities. One of them is to use uh, optocouplers. Now, we have to take into account that the uh, frequency that we, ha we have to pass, the, the rise time and fault line of this signal is very high. So a regular optocoupler coupler will not do the job. You have to uh, use an optocoupler which is really designed for this application. And of course, you'll have to need a driver in order to have the current to feed the uh, gate. And also, you need a power supply. It's a floating power supply. You can have, you can generate a power supply which is floating and used here. So this point is actually jumping up and down in, say, in a half bridge, while this driver has to sit between the source and gate and provide the pulses here. Another way, which is more common, and I'll talk about it, in, expand on it a little bit later, is this um, potential offset type of a drive. We have a driver connected, of course, to this point with the ground side of it. We have a supply, which we somehow have to provide, and I'll show you in a minute that we can do it in a simple way. And then there is a problem of providing the signal to the driver from the ground level. Because all of our electronic is sitting here, this is on the high side, could be a couple of hundred volts, uh, maybe higher. So what can be done is actually to use a transistor. This is a high voltage transistor that is turned on and off. And while this voltage drop here is actually signaling this driver as to whether there is a need for a pulse or, or not. That is, we are sort of translating this uh, potential from ground side to a higher potential around the driver. So 
As far as the power supply, this floating power supply goes, we can use a floating power supply, or sometimes it's called a bootstrap power supply, which is a very, very neat idea. It's a very, very popular approach now. And here it is. We have a capacitor, and we rely on the fact that this Q2 is from time to time uh, conducting, that is, bringing this point to ground. This is a must. If this does not apply, then you cannot use this idea. So, while this line here is visiting, so to speak, the ground side, when this is on, because in, say, in a half bridge, this will be on and off, on and off, uh, alternately. Uh, so, when this point is reaching ground, we have this path through a dial, which is charging this capacitor. Now, if this transistor now is turned off, and this point, actually this one is supposed to be turned on through the driver, and this point goes high, this dial does not conduct. Actually, it's reverse bias. But the capacitor for the time that we need to drive this transistor is providing the voltage as a power, local power source. So, so this is sort of jumping up and down. Whenever it visits ground, it will be recharged, and then as it's high, it will um, provide the charge needed to drive the transistor. This is very neat. Of course, we do need now a circuit that will bring the command, this is the pulse, from here to the higher side, to the driver, and as I've said, this can be done with this transistor with an offset. So here is an example of a sort of very classical driver. This is a half bridge driver, uh, two transistor. Uh, we drive this one, we drive this one. We have here these uh, capacitor, which is uh, with the diode discharge. This is the bootstrap uh, arrangement. Signals are coming in, and uh, we provide these pulses. Now, how does it look inside? Well, there is uh, some um, Schmidt trigger to sharpen uh, the pulses. Uh, there's some log logic, I'll talk about it in, in a minute. These are the transistors that translate the potential from ground side to the upper side. This is entirely floating here. Uh, it's isolated. This chip has to be fairly well isolated between this side and this side. This could be at a high voltage. Uh, presently, we have units to 500, 600 volts. And of course, here there will be a capacitor uh, that will uh, provide this uh, local uh, power supply and the diode uh, to charge it whenever this point reaches ground. Now, there is some logic here, which actually is a protection so that uh, these two will not turn on at the same time, um, and that actually uh, we have sharp pulses here so that uh, it's sort of immune to noise, and um, it's uh, a flip-flop here, which is turned on and off. So this is actually a logic circuit just for protection and uh, seamless operation. Let me go back to the low-side driver. Here is a commercial low-side driver. What we see here is the line going to the driver. This is the supply of the driver, and um, this is actually part of a um, PWM controller, so that um, uh, it has some other features to it, but we are interested in this part here. And let me look at it again. Here we have, uh, this is the driver, this is the MOSFET that we are driving, this is a limiting current, this actually limits the current to the value that we wish it to be. Uh, this is just a for leakage current to go to ground. And we have here these two diodes, which are recommended by the manufacturer. Uh, these are Schottky diodes to be put outside. They are sort of in a reverse direction. So let me just go and explain why do we need these diodes. Well, if we have a transistor which is conducting, this is now representing the gate to source capacitance, which is charge. There is a current flowing in the transistor, and um, and the situation is that the transistor has just sort of turned off, 
However, there is always some strain ductance in the circuit. So this strain ductor has a current which is still flowing in the direction of the current that was when the transistor was on. So at the very, very beginning, you might have a current which is actually opposite to the current that you wish to have, that is to discharge the gate. And in order to provide this current, which cannot pass through a BJT transistor this way, you have to put this uh, diode, which is catching this reverse current. Once this current uh, goes down, and actually it will reverse and will be just discharging the charge that uh, remain here in this capacitor. So this is the reason for this thing. Now, if the driver is a MOSFET driver, there is no need for the diode. The reason is that a MOSFET transistor conducts, while it's on, it's conducting both ways. Not so with the BJT, but a MOSFET conducts both ways. So when it's on, it'll be able to carry both this current and this current uh, later on. There is one more point I'd like to uh, explain, and this is uh, the fact that some drivers uh, would have two grounds to them. There's a power ground and there's a regular ground. And um, actually, this is preferred. If you have a driver, uh, try to find one that will have two grounds. Now, this ground is the ground of this circuit. Uh, this could be a controller, PWM controller. And this is the ground of the controller. The controller has many parts to them, and as a reference, as a clock, and many other uh, comparators, etc., etc. And then we have the driver. This is shown here as a BJT driver. And as you will see, this lower side here is not connected to this ground, but it is just provided as an output by itself. So in this case, uh, what you like to do is to connect it to the uh, transistor and um, this is in order to sort of lock the current of driving the gate, the gate current, within this area and not to pass it through a ground in which, uh, to which other components are connected, for example, a reference voltage a, a bypass capacitor, etc. So what you like to do is to have a local capacitor that will have enough capacitance, enough charge to provide the pulse during on. Here it is. So I'm locking the current in here. And during off, it's locking the current here. So the current, which is a high peak current that then we have seen, could be like one amp or more, uh, is isolated and it's only within this area, it's not propagating through this ground. So in order to be able to do this, you need two lines. One is the ground and one is the power ground. So here it is, uh, we have say a PWM controller, which is these two lines. But one has to be very careful because um, if you have a very high current, a spike of a current here, and there is some uh, stray inductances in these lines, there could be a large voltage difference between, say, here and here. And so if you connect this point to here, you may have a large voltage between the power ground and ground, which can actually damage the circuit. So you have to be careful about that. And one way to do it is just to connect them close and to leave this thing sort of by itself. So this will be the ground. This will be the power ground. This will be the uh, capacitors for locking the current, as I've, as I've seen. And in this case, you'll have no part of this high current um, that goes into this um, gate uh, propagating into the line here. Now, this brings me to the end of this presentation. I thank you very much for your attention. I hope that you found this uh, presentation interesting and it will be useful to you in the future. Thank you.